Lounging Sun. All right, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today is writer John Ostrander, who has written some of my favorite comic books: uh, Suicide Squad, Spectre, Martian Manhunter. Uh, a bunch of Star Wars stuff, so a lot to unpack with you today, and it is an uh, extreme pleasure to have you on the show. My pleasure. Um, so, you know, every time I'm talking to somebody, especially, you know, the first time, I always like to ask them, you know, how their love of comics kind of started. I think, well, I think a major factor in my love of comics is the fact that uh, my mother uh, read or heard about Frederick Wortham's Seduction of, of the Innocent. Mm -hmm. And um, I could read certain comics, but no superhero comics, because, you know, that, that those would turn me into a juvenile delinquent and quite possibly homosexual. With those being forbidden, of course, I had to have them. <laughs> so I found places where I could, uh, could read them, and then I bought them and hid them in my room. My mother would occasionally find me, uh, find them and give me hell and throw them out, and then I'd get some more. She threw out some comics that would be worth a lot of money today. I just, well, first of all, I just love reading I, and I love story. And, uh, uh, and God, it goes way back. I, I read Superman in the 50s and Batman. And uh, a big development for me was uh, Harvey Comics printed two thick comic books of, of The Spirit by Will Eisner. And I came across those, and I didn't know that they were uh, back in the 40s. I thought they were contemporaneous. So um, uh, I loved those. I wish at the time that they had done more. And of course, since then, I've read all the Spirit stories and even got a chance to meet with Eisner a few times. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Will Eisner is a, is a legend, to say the least. Um, yeah. yeah, I love the Spirit. Huge fan of the, of the character as well. Your career... In comic books i think it's interesting that you started out acting right mm -hmm. before you actually started mm -hmm. writing comic books so yeah. what that's a that's a completely different uh career path so what why why switch over from acting into writing comic books well i was i was into comics before i went into professional theater or, or even unprofessional theater i mean all through high school but then again i was into theater in high school as well. Um, I think that there is actually a connection between the two and being in theater actually fed into my writing uh, because I learned about plot structure from doing theater. I learned about how to intertwine theme with action. I learned how to convey character through dialogue, through theater. Um, one of the most important tools or uh, experiences I had in terms of of, uh, of writing was being in Del Close's uh, improv class, which really opened me up. So the, so the two are very definitely interconnected in my mind. And uh, uh, in fact, well, uh, the reason I finally left theater was uh, I was I was not getting large roles, not many of them. And got to the point where it was painful sometimes to audition. And uh, I was in uh, a Christmas Carol at the Goodman Theater playing such major roles as uh, Fred's Friend Number Three, Mister Round, Dancing Man, and a lot of times it, it uh, I had to as soon as I went off stage I went to the side, switched clothes, went around behind the scrim, and came back on as another part of a crowd scene. And I was doing one of those crowd scenes, walking across, trying to be in the moment, you know, as you're supposed to be really in the moment and really feeling it. And I, w and I had been writing uh, comics as well by this point. And part of me went, you know, you could be making more money writing comics right now. And that sort of ended my theater career. You know, like, uh, from there I went, uh, that was the last play that I did. And uh, the most acting I've done since then was my cameo in the Suicide Squad. So, uh, but that's, that's how that transition really occurred. 
Okay. And you started out at first comics, right? You were writing some backup yep. features, um, yep. eventually launching your own character with, with Tim Truman, with Grimjack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd also just before that been doing, uh, I, I took over Star Slayer from, uh, from uh, uh, Mike Grell. And uh, I proposed Grimjack because I knew they were looking for properties. And they went, ooh, we like him, but he's older. He's kind of vicious and uh, grim and gritty. And we don't know if that, people would go for that. And so we'll tell you what, we're gonna put him in the back of Star Slayer. And maybe in about a year or two you know, or three, uh, if he gets enough of a following, we'll spin him off into his own book. I went, all right. What happened was eight months from his first appearance, he was in his own book. He, he took off immediately. So uh, yeah, I was soon writing at least two books a month, which at the time really considered that I went from never writing comic books at all mm -hmm. uh, to doing that was, was, it took my breath away. Yeah, I mean, you're also, you're not working on established property with, with your, with having created your own character, you know, yeah. so you're building out this world, and I think it is, it's, it is interesting, like, I, I didn't realize that it had such a long run, you know, for a creator own title, that's, it's, especially now, like, I think that that's kind of rare to have, like, a good, I think, like, seven years, I believe. Yeah, six, seven years. Yeah. So that's a long time. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, the the process of creating this character and your co-creator, Tim Truman, and building out this world and kind of what was uh, the inspiration behind the character. Okay. Um, well, originally, uh, Grimjack was going to be a series of prose stories and novels, you know, like influenced by, um, by Robert E. Howard and Conan and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, I actually had a Grimjack story like that, although it was set in a uh, different world. It was set in a uh, uh, um, Chicago of the future that had gone through uh, terrible times and everything else. I, fortunately, I d no longer have that short story and I don't want it ever to, uh, to reemerge, but, but the essentials of the character were there. And he came out of a thing where um, I like what I call narrative alloys, where you take one genre or another and just kind of put them together and see how they work. Uh, Robert E. Howard did, did that with uh, Sword and Sorcery. He took um, what they called sword and sandal uh, things and then combined it with horror and, and he came up with Sword and Sorcery. Well, I took Sword and Sorcery, which I loved, and combined it with Hardball Detective, which I also loved. And gave me a hard-boiled barbarian, uh, and that was Grimjack. Uh, when I proposed it to uh, to first, I knew that they um, the the creation of Sinister was already there. Uh, it had been used in a Warp special, and was created by uh, Peter Gillis, Peter B. And uh, they were going to destroy it at the end of that. Of, the, of that story. And I said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. This is a really good concept, you know, because first was all these different separate things that never came together. So I, I thought the idea was that they could use Sinister to go from, from one comic to another if they wanted to have a, a team up of some of their properties. So um, I said, no, we'll save Sinister and then I started de developing Sinister as a place for, for Grimjack. And that's when I made my proposal and, uh, and they went for it. And how did you and uh, Tim Truman hook up? Because you guys continue to collaborate you know, throughout the years, throughout your career too, so. Yeah, um, first was looking for somebody to draw Grimjack. I didn't come in with my, uh, originally I uh, asked my friend Lennon Del Sol to draw some art for the proposal, Lennon was my artist on Star Slayer. And uh, well, he couldn't do two books at the, at the same time. So they were looking for another uh, artist. And first they came up with one guy who was totally wrong. 
didn't understand it at all. And then they came across uh, Tim at a convention and he was working at TSR doing designs and, and characters and stuff like that. But he was looking to do comics, which he really wanted to do. And they really liked his stuff. And so they said, well, look, we got this. We can give you the backup feature that we've got with this mercenary type, or uh, we got Valeria, the insect sorceress, and we're gonna do a mini series with her. And those would be three issues. And Tim took about two seconds to say, give me the mercenary. And uh, uh, so they signed it to him and uh, Tim redesigned everything. He was so enthusiastic. He threw in all kinds of sketches for ads and promotions and stuff like that. I mean, his energy and uh, 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 glee, I would say, at doing this, uh, was was what I said, and I hadn't met him yet. So, but but I loved what he was doing. And uh, shortly after we actually got going with the stories in the series, I went to first and said, "Look, let's change the contract so that Tim is also credited as creator." And they said, "Well, okay, if you want, but you know that's going to split your royalties and stuff." I said, "Yeah, I know. He deserves it for for like everything that he's brought to the to the book. Uh, for instance." Uh, the, the character of Bob the Watch Lizard, uh, mm. that's in that's all Tim. Uh, he just showed up in, in the first issue of Grimjack and he told me, This is Bob, he's a gator lizard, a watch lizard. And so I invented Bob's uh, uh speech pattern, and uh, we were off from there. But Tim had uh, uh, Tim had that whole thing. Uh, we've Tim and I finally met. Uh, and it's like we were brothers from from two different mothers. You know, it's uh, we just got along from from day one, and he's still one of my best friends in the world. Uh, him, his wife Beth, and his whole family. Uh, uh, I just love them all. So, uh, and then of course, he's shown what a phenomenal storyteller he is on his own, writing his own stuff as well, like Scout and stuff. So, uh, working with Tim is just one of the best things in the world. Yeah, I think that, you know, just the concept of the book, the, the, you know, that even just that first arc, the, you know, from the, not the backup features, but the actual ongoing, um, yeah. it's, you know, I recently reread it and it's, it just holds up so well still today. And it's just such a cool concept. And, you know, I, you know, doing the math, uh, there's an anniversary coming up and I know that some of this stuff isn't in print. Are there any any thoughts, any plans of you guys maybe doing something for the 40th, which is coming up in like a little little over a year, a little well, couple of years, I mean. Well, not yet, but maybe I should talk to the guys. Yeah. I mean, Tim right now is busy doing Scout Marauder, so I don't know how much time he has to do anything. But yeah, it would be interesting to do another Grimjack story if we can. Um, and I don't believe... Now, there were there were some collections being done of it, some trade paperbacks, but that halted mainly because at at the time we were um, working on possibly a, a, a Grimjack TV series, and reprints have to be figured into the rights that are that are available. Mm -hmm. So so we didn't get the entire run into uh, into. Uh, uh, trade paperbacks, although I think most of Tim's is. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely hope we see some some more Grimjack in the future and get some of that out of print stuff uh, back into print so, you know, can turn on some new people to it. Um, you know, uh, middle of your your run with Grimjack, you do some really something really awesome over at DC. And you, you kind of mentioned it, you had a cameo in the movie. You launched the Suicide Squad, completely different you redid that concept and uh, just really utilized some characters that otherwise, like, I mean, C, D list, I mean, it didn't matter, but you really elevated some of these characters and made them interesting. Um, you know, spinning out of the Legend series, you know, you introduced Amanda Waller as well. How did that project come about and what was appealing about working on these characters to you? Okay, now do we mean how did Legends come about or how did the Suicide Squad come about? 
I mean, let's hear both. I'm down to hear both. So, well, uh, Mike Gold, who was my editor over at first, had left first and was now a senior editor over at DC. And one of the tasks that he was assigned was to come up with not so much a sequel, but another crisis on infinite earth. Uh, that had proven to be very successful, although it had been a big risk at the time for them. So it's sort of like, well, okay, what's the next company-wide crossover that we're going to do? And uh, Mike was handed that, and he brought me in uh, to plot the book and then have Len Wein uh, uh, dialogue it, because Len was an old hand at DC, and they felt he would know better how the characters actually talked, which was fine. Uh, and then... Mike also suggested, since we had already been talking about Suicide Squad, to spin it out from Legends to, uh, to put them in and feature them and then to spin it out. Now, I got into Suicide Squad because I wanted to do uh, a, a title called uh, Challengers of the Unknown, which is one of the great titles in comics, Challengers of the Unknown. So, uh, and I think it still is, you know, uh, but uh, my, uh, my friend and editor, Robert Greenberger, said, well, sorry, you, you can't have that. Someone else has got dibs on it. But here, we got this title that appeared in five issues of The Brave and the Bold back in the 50s, early 60s. And, and you can do anything you want with it. And it's called Suicide Squad. And my first reaction is Suicide Squad. What a stupid name. <laughs> who, who in their right mind belongs to anything they would call itself a suicide squad. Come on. And then my answer came that night while I was doing something else. People who didn't have another choice. Well, okay, who doesn't have other choices? Uh, prisoners. Prisoners don't have much choices. And I was always a big fan of the villain comics that DC had at the time, including um, Secret Society of Supervillains. Uh, I love seeing the vill villains grouped together and banging up against one another. I was also, as James Gunn really figured out real well, I was a big fan of of uh, the Dirty Dozen as well. So I decided, well, okay, you know, like, we'll do it. And then, you know, like, to do the Dirty Dozen with DC super villains. Okay, that's really cool. And, but one of my rules was I only wanted the d and &E list characters because uh, all the others would be controlled by the various, either the bad office or the Superman office or, or whoever. So I wanted the ones that uh, uh, no one was really caring about. Mm -hmm. So, and my rule was, okay, it, if you give them to me, I get to do what I want with them. Uh, I won't change their past, but I may elaborate on it. Oh yeah, and I may kill some of them. And they went, okay. Uh, so, and that's how the uh, parameters of the Suicide Squad came about was I had to have control of them and I had a right to kill them if I wanted. And so, like you said, you picked the DD and those characters so that they're basically so there wouldn't be any pushback in terms of what you wanted to do with these characters. Mm -hmm. Was there any characters throughout the run that maybe you wanted to use? and were surprised that they said no to, and did you kind of, from beginning to end of the run, you know, the 60, I believe it's 66 issues with the 67th one with the Blackest Night, I think you brought it back, right? Oh, um, yeah, and then later on I did a special or two or mini series or two. Right, so was there any pushback with anything? Did you get to do from beginning to end kind of what you wanted to do with these characters? I basically got to do what I wanted to do because I was very canny about who I selected. Uh, for instance, one of the most popular features was Deadshot. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I got him from uh, an illustration in Who's Who, uh, which was their encyclopedia of their characters at the time. And uh, he didn't even merit his own page at the time. He got a half page, but um, it was a cool costume that Marshall Rogers had designed uh, when he appeared in a, uh, a, a Batman story. And there was a little bit in terms of some background for him, which I thought was also interesting enough that I could play with. So I asked for him, got him, uh, expanded on his background, 
and uh, uh, then had a lot of fun playing with them. Yeah, I think so. It, it's it's funny to see because like I mean that that came out the year I was born that that book. So I mean I've obviously gone back and read it because I'm a huge DC's. I, I love DC and Marvel, but DC's always been kind of just a little bit above um, mm -hmm. throughout my comic book reading. So it's it's interesting to hear that like Deadshot really kind of nobody cared about because yeah. when I started reading comic books, Deadshot was at least no a little bit more popular. Obviously, you know probably due yeah. to the Suicide Squad run. Um, were there any characters that you kind of wanted to use, but you just didn't get a chance to? Not really, because um, I was canny enough to keep away from those. Okay. Because uh, uh, I could sort of guess right away. For instance, I didn't want the Joker, yeah. you know, because uh, uh, I, I would have no control of him and would have to return him. I wanted characters who, from the moment you saw him, and, and if you knew the book, you had me a little bit worried about what I was going to do to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 I was just very careful about who I asked for because, you know, as a writer, I, I liked having control. The only one who I did use that I had to return intact was, uh, was the penguin because mm -hmm. uh, uh, I knew I couldn't kill him off, but I could do different things with him than what was usually done. And, uh, and that wound up being very successful. Yeah, that was that was one of the characters I was going to say that I'm kind of shocked that he he was kind of allowed to be in there because I consider him like one of like the main, you know, one of the big bat villains. So it is interesting that you were able to kind of tweak him just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and as long as you know I returned him intact, you know, um, uh, we could do things along the way, and we could emphasize what I felt was important about the penguin because I had also done a um, a thick comic book on the penguin uh that they did uh, right around the time when that batman movie was out the mm -hmm. second batman movie uh and when i played with the penguin the idea for me was okay he's kind of silly looking how do, what do we do with him and my feeling was he had to be brilliant he had to be absolutely brilliant to get away with what he's doing he's not really a fighter so he has to be a big time thinker. And uh, so I emphasize that in the character along with his, with his peculiarities. And um, that worked out, I think, rather well. And particularly for the Suicide Squad, it worked out well. I can make him a mastermind. And in terms of watching these characters that, I mean, for lack of a better way of saying it, like you kind of you breathed kind of new life into a lot of these de list characters, seeing them brought to life on the screen. Um, mm. I mean, we've had two versions now. Yeah. So one of them, you guess, you, like you said, you had a cameo in, which I, I always love seeing the creators cameo in the mm -hmm. movies. I think that's awesome. What are your feelings on the adaptations and seeing them brought to life? Okay. Anytime that some work of mine is transferred to another medium, whatever the medium is, I always begin with the idea, idea that uh, it's a different medium and they're going to adapt it just as I adapted things to it. Uh, and people certainly have a right to do that to their needs. You know, long, I only ask that they keep close to the feel of it, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I, well, actually I feel David Ayers did, to, or at least tried to as well, keep true to the uh, general feel and, and tone of, of Suicide Squad. And James Gunn hit it out of the park. I understand that there are different interpretations of these characters. Uh, for instance, Amanda Waller is a good example. Uh, the Amanda Waller of the comics is not necessarily the Amanda Waller of the animated uh, shows, which also are, are excellent, uh, or the Amanda Waller of the movies. Mm -hmm. you know, they're all different takes on that character. So uh, and I'm happy with what people do. With them you know again they try to keep it consistent and honest to what the general conception was i i especially appreciate that with amanda waller because yes she was my creation for the squad and i think that she's been an important addition to the dc universe there was no one like her really before she came along and damn few like her since
Yeah, I mean, there's very few characters that have no powers, aren't super villains that can go kind of toe to toe with Batman, you yeah. know, and kind of argue with it, and kind of put him in his place. And I think she is one of the one of the more interesting characters. And I, I would agree that I think every um, iteration of her that I've seen, whether it's the animated series, I know she's been, you know, in the Arrowverse shows yeah. and Viola Davis, I think she knocks it out of the park. I mean, yeah. they've all... I think they've done her justice, you know, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, in talking about uh, Amanda and Batman, one of the definitive uh, showings of that was the cover of the comic where it's just Amanda and Batman. She's backing him up against the wall with her finger in his chest. Yeah. You know, and I went, that's Amanda. <laughs> that's, that's Amanda. Um, you know, I, there's something else, you know, before we jump out of Suicide Squad, uh, something you did is you gave Barbara Gordon a new moniker. Yeah. You gave her the Oracle monitor. Or yeah. the moniker, I mean. Um, yeah. what, what was the idea behind that? And I mean, I guess maybe at the time she wasn't really being utilized either because, you know, she'd been crippled. So, I mean, you create, you bringing that addition to her just made her, I think, one of the most interesting characters in DC. And she continues to be like one of my favorites. I kind of miss her being in that, in that role. So I would love to hear your thoughts on why you chose to do that with her. Well, um, I was writing uh, uh, Suicide Squad at that point with my wife, Kim Yale. And uh, we were influenced basically by the killing joke, which uh, let me just say, you know, it's Brian Bolland, uh, anything he does, I, I wanna see. Anything Alan Moore does I, and does, I wanna see. Uh, and uh, there's some great stuff, but I have problems with that because uh, she's sort of gratuitously crippled, you know, uh, or, or she shot, and uh, and we knew that the bad office was not going to use her anymore, and we just said that's not the right way to do that. So we said, all right. Uh, so we convinced them to give her to us. Uh, we would do something else with her, and they did because they had no interest in her at the time, and so we fed upon her past continuity. There's one point where she was a computer expert and was working with computers a lot. Mm -hmm. And we also decided that given the angle of the gun and the make of the gun that she was shot with, if she wasn't killed outright, she was gonna be crippled. And so we wanted to keep her that way. We wanted to make sure that uh, that was the repercussion of what that story was, was that, uh, 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 her, her spine was damaged and, and, and she couldn't walk. We wanted the, to see the consequences of that. And since she was a hero, we wanted to say, we wanted to say, well, okay, how does one maintain that in the face of the adversity all of a sudden that she's facing? And uh, we designed Oracle because we said, okay, what DC needs is an information broker. And we figured out that if we did it right. Lots of other writers in, at DC would want to use her because she solves a writing problem real easy. If you have, the, there's some information that the hero needs to get. Well, either you stop the story so they can go find out the information or they call Barbara, they call Oracle and they get the information and then they're off to the races and on to the next slugfest. Uh, and we were right. You know, people all over the place wanted to use Barbara to the point where she became um, part of Birds of Prey. She became the central figure, really, I think, mm -hmm. of the Birds of Prey. And many people, including Gail Simone, who absolutely adores Batgirl, uh, has, has said that that was really one of the best iterations of Barbara Gordon to come out was the fact that uh, uh, for a long time she was better as Oracle than she was, than she had been as Batgirl, I think, because for a long time, no one figured out what to do with her. And then when they decided to bring her back as Batgirl, her character had been changed so that she can, she could be a more interesting character overall. So they, so even though they cured her, um, they, 
they had more interesting character overall with which to play i think yeah i mean yeah because i think beforehand she's bat you know batman but a woman right like yeah. she, she wasn't her character wasn't really fleshed out and i think that i do think that even though she has taken on a batgirl role again i do love that they've kind of put her a little bit you know behind the computer screen you know and, and yeah. balancing both because i do think that she i think that that's a cool role and it really separates her and makes her more unique than just somebody that's dressing up with a bat symbol fighting yeah. crime you yeah know? So I think that it's amazing that you added that uh, aspect to her. And I, and I, for the longest time, didn't even know that it started with Suicide Squad because Birds of Prey was one of my favorites, you know, like for its entire run. And I, I do think Gail Simone, uh, you can see the love she has for her whenever she's writing yeah. a horror story. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I also like, you know, other stuff at DC that like I mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, your Spectre run. Your Martian mm -hmm. Manhunter run, two characters that I really like. I kind of always gravitate towards the characters that aren't necessarily the A-list. Yeah. And you write these characters, but you treat them like A-list characters. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't write them as anything less than that, you know, like to where the, these titles could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Batman or a Superman title. So yeah. I was curious, you know, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit on the choice to write each of those characters. And um, you also teed up with Tom Mandrake for both, so. Yeah, uh, a, a great buddy of mine. Um, I, at, at one point I moved uh, to New Jersey to be near Tom and his wife, Jan Dersma, who is my artist in Star Wars. And uh, the, uh, Tom just brings such verve I, that's a word that really comes to mind with me, verb to what he draws. Uh, and uh, he and I had been working on Firestorm together and I was leaving that book, Tom was gonna stay, but then they decided, no, we're gonna end it now. And so Tom was free. And so we went, okay, I gotta grab Tom. We gotta grab something together to do. And we both had always been big fans of the Spectre. I mean, both of us. So, uh, and people said, eh, he was done just a few years ago. It didn't work. Uh, nobody can really do the specter without either uh, uh, downplaying his powers or, um, or repeating themselves very shortly. And we said, no, we know how to make it work. Give them to us. And so they did. And our solution was, well, first of all, there had been things where uh, supposedly Jim Corrigan had come back alive and the specter was just living inside of him or something like that. We said, no, Corrigan's been dead since the 30s and he died in the 30s. Also, the key we felt was Jim Corrigan. What do you do with him? And the answer, our answer was, well, in the 30s, he was a hard-nosed, plainclothes de detective. Well, what was that like? Go back and read early Dick Tracy. Go back and watch uh, the hard-boiled movies from the 30s. That's the sort of character that he was. And he's still out of time because he hasn't changed that much. So, and that fuels what the Spectre is and does. And then with Tom, you know, just give him a visual. And he, boy, he, boy, he goes to town. It was varied, it was different. Um, and we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, Dan Rasper, who was our editor uh, on the Spectre told us that, uh, okay, that we had about a year that the uh, sales were starting to decline and probably in about a year we were going to, uh, they were going to cancel the book probably. And so we said, okay, fine. You know, it gave us a year to wrap everything up. And, um, and DC also let us wind it up the way that we wanted to. Uh, we'd sort of planned that ending from very early on. And uh, by letting us end the series the way that we wanted, it made the whole run one story, which was about the development of Jim Corrigan as uh, uh, as a person. He, he's a person who has uh, 
growth only after he dies you know so uh, so that makes that interesting right there and then after that was done we uh we were hunting around for something else to do and we picked on uh the martian manhunter uh a because it was different than the specter it's more if the specter was more science uh fantasy science horror uh, uh Mar martian manhunter is more science fiction Mm -hmm. uh, in that aspect and uh, we wanted we felt that too often Martian Manhunter was just treated as a big green version of Superman many of his powers were the same and he had a few extra that Superman didn't have but we said well okay what makes him different from Superman from kal -El? well kal -El comes to earth as a baby you know he may have been born on Krypton, but he's raised in Kansas, and his values are that of uh, of someone raised in Kansas. John Jones, the Martian Manhunter, was raised and came to, to maturity on Mars, and that's a whole, and we said, well, that's got to be a whole different civilization. So he wanted to have a peek into that, and uh, uh, he came to Earth fully formed as a person and so we worked with that uh aspect of him and uh as a result i i felt we had a fairly successful run yeah and i mean also you have another detective too which you yeah. love writing so yeah, I do. um you got to play with that sandbox as well um yeah. i i you know i want to ask too i know you know, and, you know, kind of doing a little bit of research, you studied theology. So did that play a factor at all in your specter on having him? I mean, he is God's vengeance, kind of, you know, yeah. so. Um, well, okay, I should uh, start off by saying that a lot of people have focused on the fact that I was in the seminary. I was in the seminary for one year for my freshman year in high school, you okay. know, so uh, we didn't study a lot of theology. We studied a lot of other crap. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, it's the usual high school crap. Yeah. And I, uh, uh, I had, uh, I, I felt I had a vocation, but I discovered halfway through the first year there was actually a uh, overdose of watching Going My Way, um, and the TV series, not the movie, but the TV series. And also, by the end of the first year, I discovered girls, so or that girls weren't oh. icky. So uh, they were intriguing. I wanted to know more. <laughs> and dating was <laughs> was not encouraged by the seminary. So uh, I think it's safer to say that my going to seminary was, an, I, I was raised Roman Catholic. We lived across the street from the church. I went to Catholic grade school, high school, college. You know, uh, I was imbued with with all this stuff. So I think my interest in that aspect came from basically most of my life. Uh, the idea of things theological, you know, like, uh, of uh, sin, of redemption, of God, you know, uh, was all part of the specter. And uh, that, and again, that came from just my natural bent. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you said you, like, I think it was during that last year, that's when you also, on Spectre, I mean, that's when you created Michael Holt, the yeah. current iteration of Mr. Terrific. So yeah. you constantly, you keep planting, like, these, like, characters, and they just seem to continue to take on a huge role within the DCU. I mean, I think he's considered the smartest, if not, like, tied for the smartest man in DCU. And I think that uh, he also has been adapted in a couple different iterations. So um, what was your, what was the decision behind taking, I mean, I'm, I'll just say, I mean, he was corny, he was a really corny character, the yeah. original, um, yeah. at least in my eyes. So you turn that and then you take, you take the concept and you made him like one of my, I mean, he was one of my favorite members throughout the JSA run um, in the early 2000s. Yeah. So I kind of would love to hear what the what the idea was behind that about taking that concept and you know making it cool well i was interested uh, because uh in the original mr terrific who was corny and had a really corny costume uh what i was 
intrigued with, excuse me, my cat is here saying, pet me. Yes, there you go. Um, uh, are you coming up? All right. We now have my cat up visiting. <laughs> if I get anything wrong, let me know. And um, anyways, I, I had read about, uh, I mean, the, the character was killed off in a uh, Justice League, Justice Society uh, team up. And they were supposedly going to write a second part to it, which they didn't. And we finally did in the Spectre many, many decades later. Uh, but in going over who the character was, um, yes, at the, the original was extremely brilliant. And he's supposed to be, I think, the smartest man of his time. And also I read about his origin, which was uh, that uh, he'd come across some street kids under the sway of gangsters. And in order to kind of get them back on the straight and narrow, he, uh, he created this persona of Mr. Terrific uh, and, and beat up on the gangsters and stuff like that. So I went, well, okay, if you're going to do that today, what would that look like? Well, if you put him in the inner city, if you put him, you know, made the kids black, make make the character himself black. Now you gotta get down if you gotta throw up. Uh, uh, he, uh, that would play too, you know, like if he was a black character. I also liked the idea that the smartest man in the DC universe was black. To me, that, that made a statement mm -hmm. that made uh, that I found interesting and that I that I wanted to see that I wanted to see done. So uh, basically, and then Tom redesigned the costume, of course, and he, like Amanda, became a very popular character. Yeah, I think that uh, the two of them they're just they're phenomenal characters and so well so well fleshed out. I know Amanda Waller's more of an original concept, but what you did. With the Mr. Terrific concept, I think, uh, you know, Michael Holt is just, he's such an interesting character. And I, I just love, especially recently, I love the way he's, he's been utilized over at DC mm -hmm. with like the Strange Adventures book. Um, I, you know, like you mentioned Star Wars too. I, I you mm -hmm. know, would love to, to hear a little bit. Obviously, you have to be a Star Wars fan or you wouldn't have chosen to, to write oh, yeah. so many great Star Wars titles. Um the one that stands out still always to me is Star Wars Legacy with Kate Skywalker. I think that that seems like the one where you really got to flex, you know, like the the world building muscles, you know, in your in your writing because like you were so far ahead, you could really do kind of I, at least in my eyes from what I've read what you wanted to do. Um, how did uh, how did you first land in the I, I guess Star Wars offices? I don't know how else to you know say it over at Dark Horse and then. Um, I don't know. Let's just, I, I would love to hear the story okay. about, you know, the Star Wars stuff. Okay. Well, uh, to start off with, uh, Tim Truman was writing some Star Wars stuff at the time over at Dark Horse, and he had to go off and uh, work on a special project. So he, was, he wasn't going to be there for a couple of issues. And so they needed somebody else to come in. And so uh, Tim recommended me. Now, I was... <laughs> Uh, I was a Star Wars fan from before the first movie coming out. I had come across the novelization at my local comic book store, and I thought the cover looked interesting. Premise was sounded good, so I picked it up, bought it, read it, and I said, "Wow, that's that's really cool. If they can get about twenty percent of what's in the book on the screen, it'll be pretty hot." Well, they got two hundred percent of what was in the book onto the screen, and. Uh, uh, I, I at, from that point on, I was definitely a Star Wars fan. I was offered one series of about four issues. And fortunately, I got in with Jan Dersima, who I already knew and had done some work with in other places. Um, and we, uh, we came up and I sold Dark Horse on this concept. At this point, the idea was to do an anthology and you know, like each story arc might have a different writer and artist. And I said, you know what? 
what a, a you know to do that means uh, means that your sales are going to depend upon who's available and stuff. Uh, if you have a single team, whether it's me and Jan or, or, or some other team, you know, they're going to know if a certain uh, quality level was in the book and the fans will keep coming back. I, I said also, uh, you want to create your own characters for it because you can't use some of the uh, well-known characters. I mean, the characters that people would, would come to uh, the thing for. And I said, well, create your own stories. And that's where the fans, and the only place the fans can get those stories is in your comic, but make sure it's tied to the, to the uh, Star Wars universe. And uh, ultimately that's what happened. Uh, Jan and I became the regular team on it. We created character Quinlan Boss, among others, uh, for, the, for the book. And then later on when uh, that went to its natural ending because the because the films ended. Um, we uh, we proposed doing another series in Star Wars and kicking it down the timeline because otherwise you're going to trip over continuity left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, well, let's go down about 100 years beyond what is being done and create our own vision of what it was, but make sure it's got all the Star Wars elements that people really love. So we did that and uh, uh, although it played out of the continuity that had been established at that point, we were able to do it and make it uh, uh, work, particularly for Legacy. Uh, I'm very, very proud of Legacy. You know, and we, there too, you know, we, we expanded so we created a, a really a whole universe of characters. Uh, sometimes even our main characters weren't even in the book. Uh, we could do things with with others for an issue or two or three, and uh, uh, and we did that. And people just felt that they were characters that they uh, that they took to immediately. So so I'm very proud of our Star Wars work. I mean, I still nothing against. The stuff that Marvel's been doing since they took over the license, but the, my favorite Star Wars comics still are the Dark Horse stuff. You know, I think that it's, and, and I'm sure that you've probably heard this from fans, like you know, like stuff that's considered uh, not canon anymore. You know what I mean? Like to me, it to me, it's oh, it's all canon. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I just, yeah. I love that Star Wars stuff and Legacy. It is my, it is my favorite series of the dark horse stuff and i think it's because it was it felt like it felt like star wars but it also felt very different you yeah. know it felt like its own thing as far as i'm concerned it is all star wars i mean yeah. even marvel has reprinted legacy mm -hmm. you know uh in their in their own uh they don't take it as canon but ooh, so what it's there it's in print yeah, yeah. If you like it read it yeah so what so is that is it safe to say that legacy of all the Star Wars stories you've written, is that is that at the top of your list in terms of your favorite? Yeah, yeah, yeah I would say so. I mean, I, I got a chance to play with uh, some other things as well. I did a couple of issues of Purge, which were single shots. And also I had a character that I created, Agent of the Empire, mm -hmm. uh, which was James Bond meets Star Wars, which was basically the pitch. Yeah. And, uh, Randy Spadley, the editor, heard that and said, sold, you've got me now. Uh, mainly because there were such starting, there were similar things in both Bond and Star Wars. Uh, exotic locations, jumped to a lot of them, lots of action, you know, uh, and a few other things. So there were, there were things that were very much uh, uh, like each other. So, so that worked, I felt. And um, uh, and, it, and it was fun to do. Uh, he, you had somebody who was working for the Empire but believed in the Empire, and uh, that gave me a chance to do some different things with it. And um, in terms of you know, you know, like stuff that you've been working on in the past few years, like what what do you have? What are you working on now? Do you have anything in the works that you can uh, talk about? 
Yeah, um, Jan Dersima and I are working on an original concept called Hexer Dusk, of, of which the uh, first volume is out um, and it's making its way to, uh, we did a Kickstarter and um, uh, the, the volumes are getting, uh, kick, Kickstarters are exhaustive <laughs> and Jan is doing all the mailing, mainly because I'm not in New Jersey anymore. But uh, Hexadust, for those who liked our stuff on Star Wars, they would probably like this. There's a touch of space opera. There's a touch of magic in it. And um, new characters, I think some of them are very interesting. And so, uh, like I said, the first issue of that is out there. And we are working on a second. Awesome. And how can, uh, for people that didn't back, back the Kickstarter, is there a way to, to get the book still? I think on Indiegogo, and uh, Jan and I have also talked about trying to find a way to make it more widely available without killing Jan. <laughs> so, okay, cool. And anything else in the works, or is that is that uh, all that's on the table for right uh, now? That's all that's on the table right now. I mean, I may uh, uh, there's some other project ideas that I've got, but I tend not to talk about them um, before I have something more concrete about it. Uh, that's one of my rules about writing. If you get an idea, you're not allowed to tell other people about it because it's like letting the steam out of the engine. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, you want to keep in that, that impulse to create it so that you can show it to people rather than just tell people about it. If you just tell people about it, then you probably won't finish it. Okay, fair, fair enough. Well, I want to thank you uh, for joining me today, talking comic sure. books with me. It has been an absolute blast and pleasure. Um, for everyone listening and watching, uh, could you share where we could find you online? And I'll sure. drop those links down below. Sure, uh, sure. I'm on Facebook a lot. Uh, I've got my own page. I post terrible puns uh, <laughs> and anything that strikes my liberal sense of humor. And... Uh, uh, and yes, I do interact with fans there as well. So uh, yeah, you can you can find me there. Probably the easiest. All right, perfect. Well, thank you again, and uh, I would love to do this with you again sometime in the future if you're down. Sure, 